Good. Okay, so welcome back. So this is the fourth lecture and the last lecture of the uh, PIDL functions on ZP. And let's first of all recall what we claimed last time and didn't get to give a complete proof, which is that we consider the space of continuous functions on ZP with coefficients in F and in QP, where the norm of this PI, like the, the norm of the function uh, is defined to be uh, the maximum of all, for all the elements in ZP of the PIAG norm of the values of F. So that gives a Banach norm on this space here. And uh, what we're trying to prove is that these binomial polynomials, we have seen that these, when we plug in the values X in ZP, then these will have values in ZP, taking binomial coefficients. Sense. And they will form an orthonormal basis of this space of continuous functions on ZP with values in QP. So uh, in particular, what that entails is that every continuous functions on ZP with values in QP can be written uniquely in the form of sort of a kind of linear, it's an infinite linear combination of these Mahler bases with coefficients in a, uh, AN, I should, I should write here, AN in QP. And the periodic evaluation of AN goes to zero. And the, the basis that we have over here, the binomial basis, is called Mahler basis, and after, I guess, uh, the mathematician Mahler. And this expansion here is a Mahler expansion. So let's quickly recall what we did last time. We said, OK, we observed that we can simply, by evaluating my function f at you know these 0, 1, 2, this, this integer, of, uh, excuse me, natural numbers values, and then we can actually deduce what this a0 and a1, a2, the coefficients are. If I go on, I can get a list of all the numbers an. And uh, in fact, we can do it more systematically in the sense that I take the sort of the sort of consecutive difference of these functions f in the sense of fx plus one minus fx, and then you know continue on, take higher and higher orders of differences. And this looks somewhat, uh, somewhat like the taking differentials. So there's a, I think there's a, there's a, method, there, there's a, some theory about differential, uh, what's it called, uh, difference operators versus differential operators. So this is kind of kind of like a difference operators. And I'm I'm going to assume that this, if I assume that model expansion holds, then if I take the first difference, what happens is that basically you shift this x x, o, x choose n into x choose n minus one, and then if I do it n m Excuse me, if I do m times, I just basically shift this n minus m. And in fact, I get to do return equal to m here. Basically, if I have some sort of negative number here, that's considered zero. So therefore, if I evaluate this sort of mth difference function at x equals zero, I get the am being this mth uh, m difference function. And if you think about this, it really looks like taking uh, sort of a derivative of a function and evaluate at zero, then you get all the Taylor coefficients. But this, but this, but we're taking a difference operator instead. So this this argument we have over here last time explained says that if we had this expression or sort of linear combination of these binomial coefficients, if it exists, then it must be unique. So now I want to say that okay, I start with an f. I can always form this if I start with an f. I can always form these different functions, and therefore I can evaluate at zero. So I get some am. And of course, I need to show several things. First of all, that this an, if I define this way, the pi norm will go to zero. And the next thing is that that's actually the, the, the infinite sum we have over here is actually equal to fx I started out with. So basically, I need to show, starting with. with f in continuous function of zp with values in qp, I can really define, if I want to, am being fm zero for all m. And I want to show, which is somehow what we, what, what, the second step, what we do here is that the PI norm of this, I define this. So the PI norm of this will be goes, actually go to zero. 
as m go to infinity. And maybe just list all the all the steps I want to show. And the third step will be I will actually show that fx is actually equal to the sum of am xm. And uh, and finally, with all these at hand, I will show that each one of them, if I take the Banach norm on the space of continuous functions on this one, uh, excuse me, this is just one. And if I take the Banach norm of fx, that's really the maximum of all the diagonal of each of the coefficients in that model expansion. And therefore, all these three steps will show that these, uh, will show our theorem, namely that these modular bases will actually be an orthogonal basis of the space of continuous functions on ZP. So we'll start with each of the steps here. So step two. How do I do step two? Well, I'm just going to give a rough idea of this. So this is rough. Uh, so basically, I will show. Because I take this thing here, I take the mth difference of this. I want to show that as m goes to zero, uh, or excuse me, maybe I should say, uh, uh, so should say when k is sufficiently large, then the bond of a norm of f taking difference p to the k times, now excuse me, this is less than or equal to, maybe I should say, let me just write p inverse times the original Banach norm. And therefore you see that if you take, so then this would imply that if I take f n, if I, if I, if I apply this sort of repeatedly for, for n really large, this, this will be very small. And thus, in particular, if I take the, if the value the value at zero, or maybe I just write m. If I take that value as m, will be very small. So that proves the first step I want to prove. So all I need to prove is that when k is sufficiently large, if I take enough times difference, I will reduce the Banach norm of the function by at least one over p. And of course, I, I particularly want this, uh, the number of times I take difference to be a power p. That makes our calculation a little bit easier. OK, so which is bad here. So let's maybe cut this and move it all the way. Yeah. You know what? Let me cut it. Sorry. I have a little bit of trouble to organize my. Put it somewhere. Sounds good. Okay, so let's let let's prove this. So here's the idea. Uh, the idea is a little bit brutal, actually. So you want to show you want to really write down what it is from the definition. Uh, the definition is here. Takes if you do it once, you take the once difference, and then you take n's, you take a different so repeatedly n times. Now, if you do p to the k difference, then what's this end up getting is if you write it down. It looks like the following. So the main term are these. Yeah, Next, there are lots of. Hmm? Yeah, you, no, bro. No, when you wrote saying something, when you wrote the nth difference of f. You don't have any relation. Do you mean less than or equal to something? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Pardon me. You wrote the nth difference of f. Mm. What about it? Is it supposed to be less than or equal to something? Oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. This is uh, this goes to zero, maybe. Or like, you know, very, I said very small, okay. I don't know, very small. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so, so let me finish this. I mean, I, so these are the, the terms that I really care about. And of course, it's not just that. You have a sort of a binomial coefficient term and an f x plus p to the k minus i, basically. You have these terms. I mean, basically, you can kind of check that if if you do two of these, you will get f x plus two minus two f x plus one plus f x. 
So the two is already kind of a binomial coefficient two one. And if you keep do doing that sort of p to the k times, that's the expression you have. The reason I, I, I like I, I wrote it in this way is because I want to remark that this term is already divisible by p. So in terms of the norm, this is already, you know, has a kind of a one over p here. So so the, and this entire term, we're good. Now I have to deal with this part. This part, I want to say that this part I use the following fact that because zp is compact and have a continuous function f on this one, so therefore this this will imply that f is continuous. Maybe I should say comma. F is continuous, and these two will tell you f is uniformly continuous. And therefore, if you if you know that plus p to the k means that x, so we know that this is very close to because I'm adding a a huge power of p in the p-axis norm. A huge power of p means very very small. So these two points are very close to each other, and the function is also uniformly close. So therefore, when k is large enough, this thing has you know. This thing basically will go to zero. The difference will go to zero. And therefore you see that as this k gets really large, the total norm. And this is and also this is sort of uniformly for every x. And this this, this total norm will be less than equal this total norm will be less than equal to one over p of the of the actual norm of p. So that allows us to show that after you take differences operators enough time, the norm will actually decrease. And therefore, the, the value at zero will actually go to zero as m large enough. And therefore, these coefficients, the Mahler basis, the sort of Mahler coefficient I, we had earlier will go to zero periodically. So that proved step two. That's probably the, the one of the most difficult part. Well, like, this takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of uh, so, some, some work, I guess. I don't know. So step three. I want to show that whether fx is equal to the Mahler expansion, a and xn. OK, so let's maybe take the difference. And maybe I should also say that uh, because this a n has p x norm go to 0, now this sum will converge absolutely, will, will converge to something, or converge to a nice function. OK, let's take the difference here. Uh, what do we know about this difference? First, I know that if I evaluate at zero, I mean we show that the how we that's how we get a zero. So this is this is this is zero, right? We also evaluate one. We know that how we get a one. We want this these two be equal at one. So this is again zero. So basically, if I evaluate any positive, sorry, positive integer, this is zero. But on the, on the other hand, this whole thing is continuous. I think because the an converges nice to zero, and this will converge to a continuous function. The difference will also, will also be continuous. But it's a continuous function that takes value takes zero at all the positive integers, and we all know that this n is dense in dp. We've, we've been using this many times. So these two all together says that the difference is zero. There we go. And that's precisely what we want for all x in dp. So, so now we show we really show that there's a model expansion, well-defined model expansion. That's kind of a nice. So lastly, I want to show that uh, this is, uh, uh, how should I say it? Uh, this is actually form also normal basis, the smaller basis. So let's do that. Step four, I want to show that the norm of xm is one. So how do I do that? Well, first of all, for any x in zp, we, we show that this really takes value in zp. And therefore, this definitely will tell me that the norm is definitely less than equal to one. 
because it takes uh, periodic integer values. So therefore, the, the periodic norm of periodic integers are always less than equal to 1. That's great. But on the other hand, I can take x equals to m. Then x equals m, choose m, will equal to 1. And I, I so it means, means I do take, and you know, I do take some, some, some value whose pi norm is one. So combining these two together, I see that the norm of x choose m is precisely one. That's one thing. So now let's do something a little bit more complicated. So what about if I have my f written as in terms of the Mahler expansion, like that? Now I know that if I take the pi uh, sort of Banach norm of f, that's going to be less than equal to, well, because of the stronger triangle inequality, this will be the max of all the norms of a n of x n. But this is the same as if you scale something, that's just you can take the scale, the norm of scale out. And we've seen this is one. So this is nothing but just a max of a n p. So it's less. So f the norm of f is less than equal to this, for sure. Okay. So the question whether this could be smaller or not, right? Could it be? So so all, all I have to show is that whether this could be strictly smaller or not. Now I go back. So how I get this a n? So let's recall. Now my a each a n is something like f n plus uh, some number plus minus some number minus one plus minus some number f n minus two and so on and so forth plus minus some number in f zero right it, it's going to be some sort of a linear co integer coefficient linear combination of the values of f and therefore this will tell you immediately tell you that the norm of a a a, a, a p is really less than equal to maximum of this f of i for i between i guess 0 and n and this is certainly less than equal to the norm of f so now once you have this you know the right hand side is nothing less than equal to the norm of f because i mean each one of them is less than equal to the norm of f so therefore the maximum one must be less than equal to f so we're done i mean like we have you know all these, all of these two must be equal, and that sh really shows our theorem that these binomial functions or the Mahler basis they form an orthonormal basis of this space of continuous functions on ZP. With Liang, I'll stop here. Yes. Yeah, there's actually a question which is the. Uh, the most common question in a number theory talk, uh, what happens if p equals 2? Does this uh, break? This one doesn't break. No problem. Yeah, so this works for p equals 2. Luckily. <laughs> I agree. Lots of things fail for p equals 2, but this one's okay. The, the follow-up to the question is, uh, so... Uh, let me let me read. So I think the concern is about uh, when you have f of x plus p to the k minus f of x, it relies on p to the k being odd, so we get minus and not plus. Yeah, and that expression. Uh, Good point. Uh, I guess I could uh, possibly it, it avoid this by, it doesn't rely on by using 2pk if I want to. And this would automatically be f of x plus 2pk minus 2 times this plus fx. It does not rely on p being odd. Minus signs just come from the difference calculus. It's not an issue of even or odd. It all goes through. That proof is... No, it does. I mean, like, like F, F2 is just... You see it here. With the plus or minus signs, you're coming like you have a minus sign in the second difference. 
automatically not an issue of even or odd? No, I think no, I think I think it, I think it's just here. Smaller coefficients have alternating minus signs. Uh, I have to think about it. Maybe I'll I'll think about it and get back to you. But okay, I, but I do. Yeah, thank I, you. I mean, I mean here here's a, here's a here's a resolution, right? I mean, like it, if p equals, I mean, I can do two p. Oh, bad 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 bad. I can do some sort of two p k, and that's going to be ah. What am I doing? So so then I have this minus two times that plus this. If I have uniform continuous, these are essentially sort of the same number. And then, and then I can cancel things this way. Just have to do some multiplication. Very good question, Well, That's sharp. I didn't realize that. Uh, there is another question, Liang. Yes. Uh, could you remind us why the elements of the Mahler bases are orthogonal to each other? So that's a very good, so the question, or rather the question, what does orthogonal mean? So it's different from uh, when you have inner product structure, you, it takes your inner product, whatever. Orthogonal is a, maybe I should, I mean, but after a while, we don't take, I take quotation marks anymore. Orthogonal just mean this. By definition, orthogonal means this. So you're, so what that means is that, for example, y, for example, x, n is orthogonal to the other one is saying that this function, Norm is basically, I mean, or rather, if you take any sort of linear combinations of A, Xm plus B, Xm, this is the, exactly the maximum of Pi norm of A, comma, Pi norm of B. That's what orthogonal means. Orthogonal means. So it's not quite sort of there, there's, there's, there's no inner products, you can't say that. Just that. I, I guess a slight difference is that in general you always have inequality this way, but orthogonal means that you always have equality. That's precisely what we proved here. Yes. Other questions? Comments? Uh, no, no. We've cleared the deck. Thank you. Yes, good. So now I'm going to turn to the dual of this. Takes a little bit of sort of mind twisting, but okay. So let's do dual. It's called Piad measure. It's like you have the space of functions, continuous functions on ZP. And I want to take the functional on this. In a sense, a measure on ZP with values in QP, it's just a continuous linear map on the space of continuous functions. So uh, so basically, basic for any function, you specify a value in QP, and that counts as a way of telling you how to integrate. Uh, this is uh, maybe if you first see it, this is a little bit weird. I mean, like over R, there seems to be a, a unique way to how to do integration. This is uh, you know, uh, you know, Riemann integral or Lebesgue integral or whatever. But <laughs> but for P I well, there's no you can't, that, that usual integration thing completely fails. I guess because of the following. For example, if you say, okay, what what if okay, if you say, okay, vo say volume of Z P is one, say you want to do that. Okay, that's fine. But then what about volumes of uh, one over P Z P? Oh, excuse me, P Z P. You see that I mean I mean if you have a reasonable volume, this constant volume with P ID numbers as sort of values. So this i plus pzp, or maybe I just write pzp, one sec. This must be the same as volume of one plus pzp. And, and with, I mean, it doesn't matter which residue disk you take, it must have the same volume. And the total volume must be zp as well. So if you, if you equal the these two, the volume is one over p. But that's, this is okay in the, you know, in the over r, one over p is small. But in the PRD world, one over p is huge compared to one. So that's kind of a very counterintuitive, right? I mean, if you pass to a smaller subset, turns out volume is something large. I mean, uh, okay, but 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 then then the problem is you, there's no way that if you take sort of you know when you do this integration, 
in, in the sort of naive way, there's no way this is going to converge because what do you mean by integration? If you think of it in terms of Riemann integration, this will be some sort of limit, right? Of sort of sum of all the residual things, right? And then you put a sort of volume of Z, excuse me, volume of I plus P to the NZP with some integration, uh, with some sort of values maybe, right? That's what you would think, that's what you want to. But then this thing is one over P to the N. I really can't think of a way to make this limit work, right? Come on. You have one over P to the N here. This is a huge number in PRD world. So instead of really defining a Riemann integral like that, the solution is uh, just forget about, just forget about sort of the, you know, breaking apart this thing to say a way to integrate functions is just a way, just a continuous linear map on space of continuous functions. But there are going to be many ways to do that. This is called a, a measure of on ZP with values in QP. So D, ZP, comma, QP will be the set of all measures on ZP with values in QP. So here's a theorem that gives you a description of all the measures on ZP. Uh, it's better to, it turned out to be, I mean, I'll, I'll show you explicitly what it is, but uh, why to say it this way, but all measures on ZP can be given just explicitly as a power series, like that. Where, you know, B1 plus B0 plus B1T and go on, go worse. And these BIs are, are QP, uh, PI, uh, PI numbers, and they're uniformly bounded. So namely, uh, uh, there's a sort of a common denominator happening here. So explicitly, so if I have a measure here, I have to explain what it does. Uh, so what's the value of this on a function? So for fx, uh, excuse me, written in terms of model basis, Jesus functions on ZP. Then I I define this this measure, namely. So this is uh, maybe I should say this integration is just kind of a is think of it as kind of a symbol. It doesn't have any meaning of the Riemann integration or any anything like that. It's just just a symbol, or rather you should think of it as a pairing between functions and measures. But I still want to write it like that. Looks like we're taking the in integration, but I'm just defining it to be. Well, maybe I should do it this way. So I want to. I want to. What I want to ensure is that if I integrate a standard function, namely a model basis d mu x, I want it to be the nth coefficient of the of the power series I write down earlier. And if I integrate f x, so it has to be it has to be a linear combination of these model bases, and therefore you see what's going to get. You're going to get a zero. Because this is equal to you know what a zero plus a one times the first element in the model base and so on and so forth. So this is just a zero b zero a one b one plus a two b two and plus all the way. It's an infinite sum. But what makes it, but somehow we know that a the pi norm of a n goes to zero, and the pi norm of b n is bounded. And so therefore, if you multiply them together. PI yeah, norm goes to zero, and therefore this thing converges. So that explains why I need this this bi to be in QP and uniformly bounded, because I can apply it to each one of them. Okay. So basically, I guess the, the I guess space of all measures on ZP is kind of a dumb. Essentially, it just it just I mean, at this moment I don't exp I didn't explain why I want to write it as a power series. I, it could be just sort of Sequence of numbers b zero, b one, b two, and so on and so forth. Basically, you evaluate on each nth element of the model basis. You just get value b n, and you sum them up like that. But it turns out that somehow writing in the power series has a very cool way, sort of have have a very cool explanation. So this is something called a Amy's uh maybe Amy's transform or Amy's Amy's transform probably. Probably his French. She. She? Is it she? Yes, I mean. Sorry. My bad. I should have known. 
So basically, given the measure, the associated power series A mu t can be give so 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 you know basically as I said somehow you just have this supposedly just this measure just these sequences but the reason I want to form put them in the power series is because precisely the following expression so I can write it as a completely formal expression. One plus p to the power x. I'm, I'm integrating x. You can say this is a completely bizarre thing, but let's sort of. I mean, think of this as maybe maybe think of it as kind of a just formal expression for now. But let's unwind this formal expression. So remember that we talked about this uh, binomial coefficients thing, right? If I have some actual integer n in the Bonneau expansion, the Bonneau expansion will look like the following, like that. So supposedly this form expression, I should understand it as ZP, uh, integration on ZP with summation of n greater than equal to zero of XO, maybe I should write I, because I use I here, oh, sorry. X choose I times T to the ith power of D mu. Okay, and if you believe that in the PI article everything works extremely nice, so I can swap the integration and sum. Maybe I can also take out the t to the i because this is a formal variable doesn't have any meaning in, for the integration. Now what you see is I remember that my meal defined in such a way if you integrate a binomial function on that, you just get di. So you see that that's why, in some sense, why we write uh, this power series expression is because I have this sort of beautiful formula. I mean, it's transformed like that. This is, uh, I think personally, I think this is a very cool formula. Maybe I should let me let me remark here. There's another reason why. Another reason why uh, why people write these uh, measures this way, just because there's something I there's something we should notice is the power series has a multiplication, right? So you can ask, what if what what does sort of a multiplication mean, right? You have two measures, mu one and mu two. They have some sort of associated power series, and power series I can multiply them together. It, it does have a meaning. It's precisely the power series associated to the so-called the convolution product of mu1 and mu2 in the following sense, that if you integrate a function for the convoluted measure, okay? By definition, what that is, is that you're integrating zp cross zp of f y plus z mu1 y mu2 z in the sense that i call it convolutions because it's, i mean it, it looks really like convolution of course <laughs> also you should if you you're, you're somehow it's really convolution with respect to the additive group for zp and in some sense you should really think of this i mean this kind of probably you've probably have, you have seen it somewhere. If you, this looks like Fourier transform in some sense, or like maybe Laplace transform. In the sense that you know, if you take some sort of convolution product under under Laplace trans under under Laplace transform, it correspond to the multiplication. It looks a, looks somewhat like that, but sort of PI degrees can't quite. Yeah. Anyways. Maybe I'll stop here and wait to see if there's any questions about these. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm gonna proceed. 
my goal of this whole lecture is that uh, I'll eventually talk about a periodic version of Riemann data function, which will be written in terms of a measure on not quite ZP, but ZP cross. But that's why that's why I, I took this all all trouble to go through the space of bonus space of functions on ZP and then talk about the measures. But on the other hand, you know, this is cool. I think these are all very cool things that you know you don't usually see elsewhere. Anyway, let's maybe go. Let's try to go uh, somewhere. And let's just get prepared for maybe the next ten minutes to get prepared to talk about this. Uh, this periodic version of Riemann data function is called Kubata Leopold PIDL function. Let's go, maybe I'll go to through the analytic part now. So let's see. So here's a slogan What is a, a sort of PIDL function? What does it do? So in some sense, I want my PIDL function to periodically interpolate special values of neg negative values of the Riemann data function. We turn out to be rational numbers. Uh, we, we, we know that the negative number at, so the data value at negative uh, even numbers are all zero. So there's nothing to talk about. But the odd numbers, this PIADA function can, can in, so this L function will be kind of a PIADA function in some sense, or PIADA measures. This will encode the value of these. Uh, one of the way to explain what's happening here is that, I mean, why we do this is that this is, gives a systematic way to explain uh, a, a congress that's discovered by Kummer, which is proved by in an is eighteenth century. So eighteenth, I don't know, this is eighteen. So that's nineteenth centuries, right? So Kummer proved the following: if you have a pr r prime for any k greater than equals one, if I have two numbers, n one n two. They are congruent modulo p plus p minus one times a high power of p. And suppose that uh, these n one and n two, they're not congruent negative one modulo p minus one. This is a technical condition that m n i plus one is not divisible by p minus one. And this n one n two are not too small; they're bigger than greater than or equal to n. Okay, then we have this sort of strange, strange congruence, really. This uh, special value of data functions at very these negative numbers, when n one and n two are are really two, very two different numbers, they're very far apart as integers, but they are somehow very close as p at integers because you know their differences are divisible by a high power of p, and also of course at the same time they have, must be they're also kind of congruent modulo p minus one. They must be. And the value of data va function at these two points must also be congruent modulo high power of p. So in our sort of language, this number will be periodically very close. So maybe I write it this way. So, so basically, it says that if n1 and n2 are periodically close, that implies that zeta of negative n1 and zeta of negative n2 are also periodically close. So this was proved by, this was proved in the, like in the 19th centuries. But somehow people really didn't quite understand, I mean like of course people understand, <laughs> understand logic of course, but doesn't really have a philosoph more philosoph philosophical reason of why this is true, except we have a proof. Uh, or rather somehow, Something that tells you that, you know, before seeing the proof, tells me that this has to be correct, anyways. Whether you get you can give a proof or not. And probably in the nineteen sixties, or maybe a little bit year, earlier than that, during the development of the periodic theory. This yeah, theory I think also, I lost you. I can't hear you. You can't hear. I can. Hear oh, no, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay, strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we're, did you we're lost good. Me? So did you see I wrote this? You saw I explained this? I think that's the first thing we didn't hear. Oh, I see. So 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 you heard me explaining the congresses, the theorem. I think so, yeah. Okay, sounds good. I'm just repeating what the theorem says. It basically says that if n and n1 and n2 are periodically close, 
then the zeta value at, at okay, okay, uh, negative n1, negative n2 are also periodically closed. That's basically what Kummer Congress says. So it's a very sort of a very interesting way of like, uh, it has to be something, some reason behind this basically. But when Kumar first proved it, of course he has a, a, a correct proof. But people don't really understand why. You know, I mean, well, in my understanding, a proof would be sort of the correct proof if basically somehow tells you that without going through the logic, it tells you why this has to be the correct thing. Right? Anyway, uh, so, but this is not known until maybe probably 1960s. Uh, when piatic theories are largely developed and also has influenced the Yasa theory. So people are start people started to think about this so called Piadel functions. So that truly explained why this is true. So maybe here's given some example of this Kummer's congress. For example, P equals seven, I take K the congress to be two. Oh sorry, K, K, K to be two. And therefore P to the K will be this just you know P. So so now p minus one, uh, p times p to the k minus one is just forty two in this case, six, six times seven, and I take two numbers, three and forty, uh, forty five. If I take zeta value of negative three, it's one over twenty, and if you expand it, it's like one plus four times seven. If you take zeta value at negative forty five, uh, so sage or sage will probably can probably tell you this, and if you do it, if you really expand it. The first two terms is one plus four seven. You see that these are somehow the same. Let's do a non-example in the sense that I do need this n i plus one to be not divisible by p minus one. So here's again this uh, p equals seven, k equals two. I, I take five, but know that six will divide five plus one, and therefore this this condition will fail. And what happens is that somehow take these data values. The seven in the denominator, so they're uh, so they can't be congruent to modulo high power p in some sense. So I think this this denominator can also be explained somehow by what I'm about to explain. But I'm, I guess I'm I'm not so sure I want to talk about the proof now. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll record uh, I'll record something and post this on the web page to talk about the proof. Of Kummer's congruence using the things I've talked about using PID measures. So maybe for the last five minutes, let me sort of jump to the end. Oh, whoops, I didn't really have that. Did I? Or maybe I have it here. So the so let me sort of get get, get to the end of somehow the story to tell you, you know, tell you in real time what, uh, what 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 the, what somehow what we are expecting. So the idea is that somehow the PI data function, this is called a uh, Kubota Leopold PI function, is actually a measure. So it's a measure on, uh, it's, it's not quite, it's used basically at this time, it started out as a, the correct way to formulate it is it started as a measure on ZP and you restrict it to, to ZP cross. So maybe I should say, right, that's D of ZP cross of QP. So your Kubata Leopold PIDL function kind of belongs to here. And there's an additional A. I'm not gonna talk about the technicality here. But that's a correct way to define a PIDL function. And what it satisfies the condition what it satisfies is that for every n greater than or equal to two, if you integrate the function x to the n, this sort of power function, or rather you should think of it as a kind of a character. In the sense that you're you, you, you're taking the character of sending x to x to the n. It's a multiplicative character. If you integrate this thing on the cross, what what it will get is that or I should say what a is a is just some basically some 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 number in the p cross. Such that this is such that this is not basically such that this is not that this is also in this is also in ZP cross basically. And uh, uh, I mean, if 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 n n plus one is not divisible by p minus one, 
such that when you uh, the, let me get to the point. So, so such that when you integrate this the power this character here, it will essentially give the zeta value at negative n. And somehow the congruence between zeta and negative n is turned into the congruence of these characters x to the n. For a different n. It's really comes from the congruences of the character x to the n. Because we know that x to the n is very much congruent to x to the n plus p minus one times a p to the a capital N, a, a huge. So these are very much congruent modulo of a p to the, I can't think right now, n plus one. These are congruent. And therefore the corresponding zeta value will be also congruent to that number. So that's the upshot. In the sense that in the periodic world, in the sense that the periodic all function is not quite a, the correct way to form the periodic function is not quite a function. But rather a me periodic measure. Uh, in an even more fancy way, to explain what the sleepy cross is, this is somehow related to what Keith talked about, is that the sleepy cross is really, excuse me, the Galois group of the cycloatomic field of QP. And this character, the nth power character, should be really thought of as a cycloatomic character to the nth power. So somehow you, if you take the measure and you couple with this cyclotomic character to the nth power, you should get the zeta value at negative n. So that's basic sort of philosophy of sort of PI function. One minute, let me just sort of go crazy and talk about what's, what's sort of in general. So, uh, so in general, you have a lot of sort of way to say L functions, if you have heard, or probably didn't really do that, if for those who have known L functions. For those who know uh, sort of module forms, there are L functions attached to module forms and so on and so forth. For each sort of the usual L function or data function or generalization of a data function, conjecturally, there should be a way to make that into a periodic L function. But every time the periodic L function will be some kind of a measure or in general distribution on ZP cross. And it should satisfy some conditions, uh, properties, like the following. If you integrate some x to the n power, and this should be some, up to some simple factors, being your L function evaluated as some sort of particular integer place, where this n corresponds to the n here. So that's sort of the general philosophy of pi functions. And I guess I'll probably end here. There's a lot to explore after what I talk about. So what I talk about is just sort of very basic things about uh, PID functions on ZP. And I hope that this will lead up to something sort of more interesting and more advanced study. That I hope you will be interested in going forward to explore these in your, I guess, career, like, you know, in your PhD study in the future, I guess. I'll end it here. And hopefully I'll add another uh, video to explain the construction of this measure, which is very explicit turned out. I'll stop here.